So in the Central Valley, we once had a vast system of about 4 million acres of wetlands and wetland-like features, this integrated mosaic of wet stuff. And since that time, uh, we've lost about 95% of those habitats. California Central Valley is, is home to one of the largest agroecosystems on the planet. Since the loss of the wetlands, migratory birds are now very dependent on what's happening in that agricultural land um, to find places to forage and to, and to spend the winter. So our work with farmers is really an integral part of protecting the flyway. Water birds need water uh, to give them access to a lot of their food resources. Um, shorebirds in particular eat a lot of the aquatic invertebrates that grow in the water. And so by knowing where the water is, we can really maximize the value of the restoration and conservation we do for water birds um, in the Central Valley. So the NASA and USGS data that are available allow us to make distribution maps on the probability that water might be in any given pixel, so that's a 30 meter by 30 meter cell anywhere within the Central Valley of California. Um, the real value of the satellite and Landsat archive is that we're able to look at the water distribution at a very fine spatial scale, so this 30 by 30 meter pixel, which is really relevant in terms of understanding habitat for migratory water birds. But we're also able to then look at that across a very large spatial extent of the entire Central Valley. Point Blue Conservation Science has been one of our trusted conservation partners at the Nature Conservancy for many, many years. And so I reached out to our partners at Point Blue and we started working together on these Landsat data to try and perfect ways that we could use it to predict water availability in the Central Valley. So simultaneously, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, was really making uh, great strides in using citizen science data to predict when and where birds would occur. I'm Steve Kelling. I'm the Director of Information Science at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I run a project called eBird. And eBird is a citizen science project that engages the public to submit checklists of their bird observations to a central database. Uh, currently, we collect about 100 million observations a year. What makes eBird really unique, though, is that because we collect data year-round, we can, we can essentially describe the entire life history of a bird or a population of birds um, as they move throughout the landscape. So when we think about how a bird moves across a hemisphere, uh, we can use MODIS uh, land cover information to allow us to make these habitat relationships with particular species of birds. And, and with that kind of relationship, we can then make predictions uh, in areas where we don't have information about birds, but we do have information about the habitats that they're in. Yeah, what we were able to, to show was that that there was a high correlation between um, abundance of uh, shorebirds with rice farming. Um, they go out to the rice fields and feed during the day and then go to the refuges at night to roost. And the aha moment really came with putting these two data sets together and realizing that there were some horrible mismatches. So we had models predicting high abundances of birds at times when there was not very much water. And that made us realize that there was something we could do out there to make that place better for birds at that time. Our program, Bird Returns, allows us to work directly with farmers to help them help us create bird habitat. And rice farmers uh, typically flood their fields uh, to grow the crop. So we knew that there was water available, just not at the right times and places to help the birds. So by working with rice farmers, we were able to essentially rent their fields for a couple weeks a year, and instead of growing rice, create the conditions which would grow birds or create habitat for wintering birds. Look, these birds are migratory superheroes. Uh, they mystify us. The shorebirds we work with are breeding in Alaska and wintering as far south as southern Peru. Um, 
we're talking up to 20,000 kilometers each year some of these small birds are flying. And so it behooves us to at least help them on their journey, provide this re food resource for them, but to do it in a responsible way that again shows our respect for the limited resource that water is today in the Western United States. Bird Returns is having a lot of impact, both for um, wetland conditions and for farmers, but also for the birds. And we're monitoring birds on all of the fields that we flood out there, and we're comparing those with bird observations on fields that aren't flooded. So we're finding densities that are 30 times uh, uh, greater on our fields than on the comparison control fields. The ability of them to use refuge lands and a compatible agricultural landscape allows us to manage the whole valley as an integrated matrix. This is really the power of, of using these kinds of data to make conservation decisions, not only for the Nature Conservancy, but also for public lands and for private land managers.